Hello, I'm doing a book review, and the book I want to review is The Shining by Stephen King. Now, The Shining was published in 1977, and this is Stephen King's third novel, which he wrote right after Carrie and Salem's Lot. Now, I technically have two copies of this book. I have this edition of the novel, which is obviously a newer printing of the book, but I also have The Shining in this book. This is actually a collection of four of Stephen King's novels that were put together into one, and those books are... The Shining, Salem's Lot, Night Shift, which is a collection of short stories, and Carrie. Now, the Overlook Hotel, the setting of this novel, was actually inspired by a real hotel in Colorado called The Stanley. Now, I believe shortly after Salem's Lot was published, Stephen King and his wife Tabitha spent a night at the Stanley Hotel, and according to the story, they were the only two guests at at this hotel, and apparently this was a really eerie experience for Stephen King, with him and his wife being the only two people in this hotel, aside from the employees, of course. And apparently that night, Stephen King had a dream of his son being chased through the halls of the hotel, and this ended up inspiring Stephen King to write a story about a haunted hotel. Now, the Stanley Hotel is actually rumored to be haunted, did, and it's been featured on an episode of Ghost Hunters and an episode of Ghost Adventures. Now, besides this real-life hotel, which may or may not be haunted, Stephen King also took a lot of inspiration from other works of literature and other ghost stories like Shirley Jackson's The Haunting of Hill House and the Edgar Allan Poe short story The Fall of the House of Usher, as well as Edgar Allan Poe's Mask of the Red Death. King also drew a lot of inspiration from the 1973 Robert Moran Rasco novel, Burnt Offerings. I also wouldn't be surprised if King maybe drew some inspiration from the Richard Matheson novel, Hell House, because I know Richard Matheson was a huge influence on Stephen King. Now, The Shining is much more than just a ghost story. It's also very much a story about alcoholism and addiction, and about how alcoholism can really change a person and also tear a family apart, and really this is a story about the breakdown of the family unit. It only uses ghosts as sort of a metaphor for all that. Now, Stephen King is very open about how at the time he wrote this book, he was a recovering alcoholic, and before Stephen King really found success as a writer, he was pretty much a raging alcoholic, and in a lot of ways you could look at this book as being sort of like a confession from Stephen King about his alcoholism. Now, The Shining was made into a movie in 1980, which was co-written and directed by by Stanley Kubrick, who is arguably one of the greatest filmmakers of all time. Now, anybody who has seen the Stanley Kubrick film, but has also read this novel, would realize that the movie and the book couldn't be more different, and I really do look at the movie and the book as being two completely different animals. Like, Kubrick really took King's novel and really sort of made it his own, and because of that, I consider the the movie and the book to be two separate entities, and I personally don't think one is better than the other, but I know people who say that Stanley Kubrick ruined Stephen King's novel, and I also know people who think that Kubrick improved upon King's novel, but once again, I personally don't think one is better than the other, because for me, the movie and the book touch on very, very different themes. Now, I'll talk more about the film adaptation of this book at the end of this review. Now, the plot of The Shining is it's about this recovering alcoholic and struggling writer named Jack Torrance, who previously lost his teaching job after pretty much assaulting a student, but his friend managed to pull a few strings to get him the job as the caretaker for this hotel in Colorado called The Overlook, which closes every 
winter and is in need of a caretaker and Jack is in need of a job so he immediately takes the job as the caretaker for the Overlook Hotel. So in the novel Jack and his wife Wendy and their son Danny end up moving into the Overlook Hotel for the entire winter and they're there all by themselves and eventually they get snowed in so they can't go anywhere and throughout the novel you see these tensions between Jack and Wendy really start to escalate. Now, Jack and Wendy already had kind of a rocky marriage even before moving into the Overlook Hotel, but ever since they arrived there, things just start to get much, much worse because it turns out that there is an evil presence within the Overlook Hotel, which is slowly driving Jack insane. It turns out that the Overlook Hotel has a very violent history, like it has a history of murders and suicides, and it turns out that the people who died in the Overlook Hotel, their spirits are now trapped there and are now haunting the hotel. But it turns out that there is another presence haunting the hotel, an even more powerful and more evil presence that could possibly be demonic, and this presence is possessing the hotel itself. Like, the hotel is essentially alive, and it's pure evil. So, it turns out that the spirits in the hotel are playing into Jack's personal desires and his personal demons, and they're trying to drive Jack to murder Wendy and Danny, specifically Danny, because it turns out that the Overlook Hotel wants Danny's soul. Because it turns out that Danny has psychic powers. He has these powers which are referred to in the novel as The Shining. And the reason the Overlook Hotel wants Danny's soul is because it wants The Shining. Now, I thought The Shining was a really good book. However, I will say the book is actually quite typical of a lot of haunted house novels and ghost stories that were written in the 1970s. Like, in the 1970s, for some reason, ghost stories and stories about psychic phenomenon were big in the 1970s. Because the 70s was really this time where you saw a real interest in the occult start to happen and I feel like this book very much plays into that and it is such a 70s novel and I'm not saying that like it's a bad thing but the book is very typical of a lot of haunted house novels that were written back in the 1970s. But what definitely elevates this above other stories of the same ilk that were written around this time really is the themes in the novel. Because once again, this book is very much about alcoholism and about addiction. And it's about how alcoholism can really change a person and in a lot of ways could tear a family apart. And this was definitely a very personal novel for Stephen King. In a lot of ways, you could consider this book to be sort of semi-autobiographical, like the character of Jack Torrance is very much a stand-in for Stephen King himself. And in the book, you realize that Jack Torrance has a lot of severe anger issues, and he seems to think that having a little drink will make his problems go away, but of course, in reality, it would only make his anger issues worse. Like, alcohol really sort of induces the problems that are already there, the same way that the spirits in the hotel induce the problems that Jack already had. And so much of this book is really about Jack's addiction to alcohol and his need for another drink and that's exactly what the ghost in the hotel play into and that's how they make him sort of like their puppet. And what I find to be really fascinating about the character of Jack Torrance is he really does start out as the protagonist of this novel. Like in the beginning of the book he's a genuinely likable character. Like you could tell he has anger issues and he has issues 
issues with alcoholism, but he's still a good man. But as the story goes on, he just becomes an evil, evil bastard. And he ends up becoming the antagonist by the end of this story. And once again, the book is a great commentary on alcoholism and how alcoholism can really change a person. And I'm sure Stephen King, being a former alcoholic, really did put a lot of himself into the character of Jack Torrance when he wrote this book. And since Jack is a struggling writer, you could very much look at this book as being sort of a commentary on the years before Carrie was published, when Stephen King was struggling to feed his family. So once again, this was a very personal novel for Stephen King, and the book is semi-autobiographical in a lot of ways. Like, in a lot of ways, Jack Torrance is sort of a stand-in for Stephen King himself. And I really feel like when Stephen King wrote this book, he was really sort of expressing a lot of his personal fears about what could have happened if he didn't get the help he needed for his alcoholism. Another sort of interesting theme in the novel is this idea of the child repeating the sins of the parent. For example, in this book you realize that Jack Torrance grew up with a really abusive father, and you start to see him become just like his father was. The same thing with Wendy. Wendy's mother in this book is described as being a really nasty person, and her biggest fear is becoming like her mother, and the hotel sort of plays into these fears that both Jack and Wendy have of becoming like their parents. There also seems to be sort of a subtle commentary on misogyny in this book, because in the beginning, it never says flat out that Jack is a misogynist, but as the book goes on, he starts making, like, little sexist jokes, and also as it goes on and you see the spirits really driving Jack insane, he ends up becoming almost a full-fledged misogynist by the end of this story, but then again, you're not sure how much of that is actually Jack, and how much of that is the hotel taking possession of Jack. But the book does sort of imply that Jack may have had some misogynistic views, and of course the hotel is exploiting this and really kind of amplifying this. Now, while a lot of this book really does focus on the rocky relationship between Jack and Wendy, to me the most interesting relationship in this novel that you see explored is the relationship between Danny and this man named Dick Harlan. Now, Dick Harlan is this cook at the Overlook Hotel who they see in the beginning of the novel right before all the staff leaves and leaves the hotel to them, and Dick Harlan also possesses the Shining as well, but it turns out that Danny is an even more powerful psychic than Dick Harlan himself. But in the book, you see almost a father-son kind of relationship develop between Harland and Danny. And I think another theme in this novel really is fatherhood. Now, in the book, you realize that Danny does really love Jack, but you also see this father-son relationship develop between him and Dick Harlan because they have this connection with each other, because they both have the same type of psychic ability. And Dick Harlan really is a very likable character, and honestly, he might actually be my favorite character in the entire novel. And Harlan, even though he's absent throughout much of this novel, he ends up playing a really important part by the end of this book, but I don't want to give too much away about that. Another really interesting character in this book is the character of Tony. Now, throughout the book, you're not sure if Tony is supposed to be an imaginary imaginary friend that Danny has made up, or if he's actually some kind of a malevolent spirit that is trying to help Danny, or if he's something else entirely, but the character of Tony is really interesting. And Tony could almost be looked at as sort of like Danny's guardian angel in a way. But yeah, The Shining was a really good book. It's a great ghost story, but there also are some deeper themes in the novel that really sort of elevate it in a lot of ways, and 
and it's definitely one of King's best books. However, I will say that I don't personally find this to be one of my favorite Stephen King novels, like, because there is a difference between best and favorite, and it's definitely one of his best books, but it's not one of my personal favorites, though. But it's still a great book, and I definitely recommend this if you're a Stephen King fan, and, and if you're a fan of ghost stories. Now, most Stephen King fans know this already, but a lot of Stephen King's books actually take place in the same universe, and a lot of them interlock with each other. And even though this was only Stephen King's third novel, a lot of his later books would actually connect back to this one. For example, the character of Dick Harlan from this book made a brief appearance in Stephen King's novel, It. And oddly enough, he actually had a pretty important part to play in it, even though he only showed up in one scene in that novel. Also, knowing that this book takes place in the same universe as It, there's a scene in It where Beverly mentions this serial killer from the town of Castle Rock who murdered all these women, and she's of course referring to the serial killer from the Dead Zone. So the Dead Zone is also set in the same universe, so knowing that, you could draw a connection between the character of John Smith from the Dead Zone and Dan and Dick from this book, like, perhaps John Smith also had The Shining as well. Also, there's a certain point in Stephen King's novel, Misery, where Annie Wilkes tells Paul Sheldon about the Overlook Hotel, and she actually mentions the events from this book, and she even mentions Jack Torrance, not by name, but you know who she's talking about. Stephen King also wrote a fantasy series titled The Dark Tower, and in the Dark Tower series, there are characters with similar powers to that of Danny and Harlan, only in the Dark Tower series, they call it The Touch instead of The Shining. But the Dark Tower series actually connects all of Stephen King's other books into the same multiverse. So since all of Stephen King's books are connected, connected to the Dark Tower series, you could assume the characters with the touch in the Dark Tower series actually have The Shining. Now, in 2013, Stephen King wrote a direct sequel to this novel uh, titled Dr. Sleep, which is apparently about Danny Torrance as an adult. Now, I've never read that book, but it actually sounds pretty weird to me because apparently it has something to do with vampires, from what I heard. Now, of course, in 1980, there was the film adaptation of The Shining, which was co-written and directed by legendary filmmaker Stan Stanley Kubrick. Now, of course, everybody's familiar with the Stanley Kubrick film. It really has become almost one of those quintessential horror films in a lot of ways. Even if you're not a Stephen King fan, and even if you're not a fan of Stanley Kubrick, you still know the film The Shining. Even if you've never seen it, there are so many different pop culture references to The Shining that you, chances are you're familiar with The Shining, even if you've never seen the the film. Now, Stephen King has always been very dissatisfied with Stanley Kubrick's take on the story because, as I mentioned before, Kubrick really took King's novel and really sort of made it his own. And to me, I don't really like comparing the two. Like, to me, both the movie and the book are completely different entities. Now, the movie does have the same basic premise as the book, but to me, the movie touches on very different themes than the novel, and a lot of people criticized the movie for removing all the subtext. I personally disagree with that. To a certain extent, it does remove some of the subtext from the novel, but it also adds subtext as well. 
Because while the book is really about alcoholism and addiction, and about how addiction to alcohol could really change a person and really sort of tear a family apart, the movie The Shining, once again, has a very, very different theme and a very, very different message. Now, a lot of critics have read into the film that the film is actually making a commentary on white patriarchy. Like, a lot of critics have read into how in the film, you find out that the Overlook Hotel is built on an Indian burial ground. A lot of critics have read into it that that's supposed to be a commentary on what we've taken from the Native Americans. And the fact that the three main people that Jack Torrance hurts in that movie are Danny, who's a child, Wendy, who's a woman, and Dick Harlan, who's a black man, is supposed to be sort of a commentary on, once again, what white male patriarchy has done done to children, has done to women, and has done to black people. Now, you could assume that maybe that's critics reaching way deeper than even Stanley Kubrick intended. But to me, there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with finding meaning in a film that maybe the filmmaker didn't originally intend. To me, that's what makes great art. Great art should be made to be analyzed, and even though I love the book, one criticism that maybe I will have for the book is that the subtext in the book is a little more surface level. Like, you could obviously see that the book is about alcoholism, whereas the subtext in the movie movie, you do kind of have to think a little bit more about it and really sort of read the film a little bit more. And to me, Stephen King and Stanley Kubrick are two very, very different artists with two very different views on the world, and of course the movie was going to be a very different take on the story because, once again, Stanley Kubrick is a very different artist than Stephen King, or I should say he was because he did die but what I mean is he was a very different artist than Stephen King. Now, you could argue till the sun burns out who's the better artist, but once again... I personally don't like comparing the movie and the book The Shining. To me, they're two very, very different animals. Now, in the film, Jack Torrance was played by Jack Nicholson, and it's definitely one of Jack Nicholson's most iconic performances. Now, I know Stephen King was also dissatisfied with Jack Nicholson's performance in the movie, because the thing about Jack Torrance in the film is he's a lot less sympathetic than he is in the book. Like, in the book, Jack Torrance is a very sympathetic character, whereas in the film, he kind of comes off as being kind of crazy even in the beginning, and even in the beginning, you could kind of tell that this guy is already a racist and a misogynist, whereas in the book, the ghost really had to push Jack Torrance into becoming that. In the movie, he's kind of already fucked up even in the beginning. The ghost really don't have to push that far to get them on his side, but to me that kind of adds to the themes of the movie. At the same time though, I do understand to a certain extent why Stephen King was so dissatisfied with the movie, because the book was such a personal novel for Stephen King that I could understand King being a little peeved that Kubrick really took his book and made it his own, but me personally, if I wrote the book, I personally would have been flattered that Kubrick took a very, very different take on my story. And while I understand Stephen King's dislike for the movie, at the same time, though, I actually feel Stephen King should be kind of grateful to the movie because at the time the movie The Shining came out, Stephen King really wasn't the household name that he is now. And I really feel like the movie version of The Shining is what really pushed Stephen King into being a household name. And a lot of the references that you see to The Shining in pop culture are specifically references to the movie rather than the Stephen King novel. But once again, I don't think one's better than the other. I just think they're two very different takes on the same story. 
Now, eventually I am going to do a review on the movie The Shining. It might not be for a while, but eventually I will do a film review of The Shining because there's a lot to talk about with that movie. Now, because Stephen King was so dissatisfied with the Stanley Kubrick film, in 1997, him and director Mick Garris made a remake to The Shining, which was a made-for-TV movie, which was a little more true to the book. Now, I haven't seen the 1997 Shining movie since I was a little kid, but from what I remember of that movie, I remember it being not that good. Like, yes, it was a little more true to the book, but it also wasn't a very good movie. And also, not for nothing, you're trying to follow up Stanley fucking Kubrick with... Mick Garris, and I, I don't want to be mean because Mick Garris really does seem like the nicest guy in the world from like interviews I've seen with him, but he is a very, very hit or miss director. But I'm guessing Stephen King and Mick Garris are really good friends because a lot of the movies that Mick Garris has done have been Stephen King adaptations. And also, I think Stephen King is a brilliant novelist. Like, he's easily one of my favorite authors. At the same time, though, I'm not sure he always knows what's best for a movie. Like, I'm not sure he always understands that what works in a book might not work in a movie, and vice versa. But yeah, the 1997 version of The Shining, while it is a more faithful adaptation to the book, from what I remember, keep in mind I haven't seen it since I was 12 years old, but from what I remember of the movie, it really wasn't that good of a film. Now, this is not technically an adaptation of The Shining, but recently you had the film adaptation of the Dark Tower series, and I mentioned before the possible connections between The Shining and the Dark Tower series. Well, in the Dark Tower movie, they outright call psychic powers Shining, which was an obvious reference to both this book and possibly the Stanley Cooper film as well. But yeah, that was my review on The Shining by Stephen King, and bye.